name is Jim McAllister. I'm an eighth Dan martial artist, uh, hold the rank of professor. I'm coming on shortly to Liquid Bullet Productions and you'll be able to see um, a resume of what I do. Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. Joining me today is 8th Dan Professor Martial Arts Master, Mr. Jim McAllister. Thank you, Jim, for coming. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Jim, can you just, um, obviously I've cut that short with your titles there. You've got so much history of martial arts. Can you just give us a run through of your, your headings, right. please? Okay, well, officially I'm graded as 8th Dan. Uh, I'm the head of British Fudoshin. A title was given to me by Professor Lawrence when he died. Uh, I formed my own organisation called McAllister Martial Arts, which has subsections of McAllister Kickboxing, and so I'm head of that. Um, I also formed a system called Bujatsu, which is a variation of martial arts, and what I've tried to do is to put together my sort of uh, collaboration of martial arts together under one umbrella for certain people. Yeah. Also, Jim, just uh, just going to touch lightly first, um, also an author, and you've wrote a few of your own books. Yes, um, I wrote three books. My first one was my autobiography. The idea of that, I can want me to show you that, yep, this yep, one here. It up for us. It's called Ungifted. It's called Ungifted, predominantly because I'm ungifted. Um, and I wanted to be an inspiration to people that they could achieve things with tenacity, dedication, and you know, giving their self-esteem a bit more of a boost. So yep. it's got my ventures in there. Good and bad, some are perhaps not so publishable, but it's still in there. <laughs> and then I wrote um, another one called The Journey, which is this one here, which is um, just a story. It's based on facts with different people, and the names have been changed. I'm in there a couple of different places. It's just my sort of idea of doing a little novel story or something. Yeah. And then this one here was what took me ages to do, an encyclopedia of martial arts. Um, and this one here, I've tried to cover as many martial arts with an unbiased opinion of mm -hmm. everything. So I've tried to give a backdrop from sort of Tang Soo Do to Karate to Kung Fu. And then also I've mentioned my inspirations and teachers and some of the people that are in films and what have you from my perspective. Yeah. Um, I always do believe that martial arts is an opinion based on experience and tuition. Yep. Okay, Jim, right, so before we get into uh, all the gritty stuff, let's just go right back to the beginning, sort of where you grew up and how your upbringing was and go okay. through. Well, I was born in New Cross and, um, you know, then we moved down to Thurrock. At school, I was absolutely useless. My only skill was trying to make people laugh and, and I had a reasonable success in some of the playground fights. Um, but I was academically not that great considered to be a bit dyslexic if they would have had the word then. Yeah, it was or, not really sort of established then, was it? And it's also difficult to pronounce, so that didn't help. <laughs> um, I was more concerned with trying to make the class laugh with one-liners than being academic. Sports-wise, I was not picked, and it was at a time that if you wasn't good at sports, you just either stood on the side or went over the woods, so you wasn't encouraged. So nobody with any lack of talent was encouraged yeah. so then i left school and worked in an office and i was just interested in motorbikes coming up to girls at the time um, went on holiday one year to mallorca with some friends who were all athletes come back having lost about two stones through drinks and late nights and everything and my father who was an ex-marine d-day veteran and also boxed encouraged me, or actually forced me, to go to the local boxing club, which was Chapel and Tilby Boxing Club. He said, because at the moment, you don't look quite so bad, because although you're bony, you look brown. So that yeah. was his encouragement. 
<laughs> so, I, so I went along there and there was Mickey Malt, Brian Langman, Jeff Langman and all the conditioned boxers were training and the smell of sort of white horse oil and perspiration. It was scary, but I stuck it. And my warm up was doing the punch bag and the bags. Mickey Malt took me under his wing. And then I become a sparring partner for everybody, or a punch bag, as it probably were. Yeah. Um, I had lots of different incidences up there, but I was okay. I wasn't too bad. I even had sort of aspirations of fighting for the club. Uh, unfortunately, I had a shoulder operation, which was either a reason or an excuse, and I'll never really know on that. <laughs> but I become the trainer because I could box a little bit. I'd already had quite a good punch, and I had tenacity, so I stayed boxing up there for f five years plus, become the competition secretary, which in turn put me in good stead for later on when I did kickboxing shows. Yeah. Um, then um, karate really was in early 70, had really sort of just started to come into this country and a friend of mine suggested we went to a karate class. So we went to the United Services Club, which was then called the Essex Martial Arts and trained up there in probably a sort of a heathen, barbaric way. Um, we used to run on the gravel with bare feet, knuckle press-ups on the gravel. And it was, I wouldn't say a bastardized system, but it was a, a combination of judo and karate. Yeah. Um, Jeff Salmon, John Lynch, Peter Button, Reg Towers, were all my sort of black belt instructors. And at that time, I see the black belts as being gods. I didn't know anything to compare them with. Uh, and I got up to my black belt with them. Yeah. But while I was there, I then started to understand that although we was called Taekwondo, it wasn't truly Taekwondo because Tom Hibbert from the AMA come down with a Taekwondo uh, master and said we well, was training very hard, very good, but not Taekwondo. So it, it cast some sort of shadow of doubt so I went to Malaysia and trained with Johnny Lowe, who was the Indonesian karate champion with Peter Button. And we trained out there and it was very, very good for kudos because I've been abroad. Most people hadn't been abroad then. But unfortunately, the system was sort of conflicting to anything that I was interested in. So it was kudos more than anything else. So Jim, what, what is kudos there? The kudos was, um, it gave me recognition when people would be talking of me and saying that, you know, Jim had been to Malaysia or people thought it was Japan or China and yeah. trained out there. So it, it gave me some sort of recognition, Got which you. was yeah. fine. But realistically, looking back on it, it taught me one or two things. How to use chopsticks was probably the main thing I got out there. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I come back from there and then I started to look around at different systems because I was not despondent, but just a bit concerned that I wanted to sort of further my knowledge. And that wasn't being disrespectful, it's just that the class was in a bit of a political, you know, sort of uproar at the time. Yeah. So I went to train with Meiji Suzuki, Tachi Suzuki in, in Wadaru, and it wasn't for me. Um, I trained with Eddie Witcher in Shotokan, and again, it didn't really tick the boxes that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Uh, I spent most of my time on holiday looking for clubs in Spain, in Malta, in Tenerife, um, all different countries I went to. My family sort of took a bit of um, a back burner while I was on holiday because I'd be looking for clubs and training. I was then introduced to a guy named Ian McGarity. Uh, Ian McGarity was one of Bob Lawrence's top students who was superb. He actually took me under his wing again one of the nicest people I've ever met, and I owe lots of things to him. He was as tough and as good as everything. So I trained with Ian. At that time, I was running a small class in Chadwell, which people like Tony Childs and uh, Albie O'Connor, Mark Adams, all those people used to come along, and we had a Friday night class. I trained with Ian for years. We used to tr become good friends, and then he decided to go to Japan and suggested then I go to see his teacher, who was Professor Bob Lawrence. And to describe Bob would be very difficult if you had not met him. Should we say he wasn't um, Bruce Forsyth with his skills, of um, his social skills. <laughs> he's, he's incredibly talented. He was as strong as an ox, multidisciplined, 
didn't suffer falls. And when I went to him, uh, he said that I can train with him, wear whatever I want. And he made it clear the first week that I should go back to white belt, which I did. So I had to go back to white belt with him. At this time, I was awarded the first... So at that stage, you was already a black belt? I was a black belt in two systems. Gone back to... Because I was a system in Malaysia, which I got graded out there, and also with the Essex Martial Arts. Yeah. So now I had to go back to white belt right. and start again. Now, whether or not it was more difficult because he knew my history, because he wasn't all that keen on my past instructors, or it was just the toughest, I don't know. But I trained with Bob. And he was a hard taskmaster, but the best motivator I've ever known. He would, he never shouted, never did anything, just moved his glasses and gave you a look of despondency. So I trained with Bob and eventually got up to my first dan with, um, it was then called the AOFA, which was the Association of Oriental Fighting Arts. Mm -hmm. He later changed it to the British Fudoshin. Fudoshin being a concept more than a style. So I trained with him. And, and I felt comfortable. I was good. I was one of his sort of top black belts at the time because my strength was my strength. My flexibility was not my strength, but I, I managed, I won the tournament and fought lots of people that were dormant and all different things and held my own okay. So I was interested and I was happy. And then one of my other friends, Gary Hogman, suggested we went to a kickboxing show, which we did with Pado O'Keefe had hosted it. Now this really sparked something off because I see the more fluid movements, the boxing skills with the karate side of it, and I got hooked. So my karate went a bit on the back burner for a while, not um, dedication, but more passion because I liked the idea of being flowing around with the kickboxing. Yeah, so I suppose for you it was mixing your, your history of boxing with the kicking as well. So That's was, exactly what, was the, yeah. what, what inspired me to do it. So I trained with that. So I was looking for teachers. So I went to Master Cam and asked, and went to his classes and asked him if he would teach me privately. He declined, saying I was too cocky, <laughs> um, which is an, uh, an irony really because, you know, in later times when he helped me out with the kickboxing show, we become friends. And I've trained every Wednesday morning at his house for 31 years. Blimey. So I think I, I won him over in the end. <laughs> he was, but Master Cam was different to you know, Bob Lawrence because Bob was very rigid and Master Cam was more, very analytical. So that was Bob, uh, Master Cam's sort of assets and more understanding. So we've trained together, run courses and done lots of things. So then in the kickboxing side, I went to uh, Lincoln Boney, who refereed one of my shows, and I trained with Thai boxing with him. And then I got introduced to John Longstreet, who was the world middleweight champion in America. So I went over to train with him. And again, we become very good friends. I would train with him. He would come over to England and run courses for me, and we would be back and forward training with each other. So again, this put me on the uh, kickboxing scene. Yeah. Because up until then, I wasn't a kickboxing champion and I was running kickboxing classes, which was caused some sort of scepticism to some people. Um, but having trained with John, and it, it, gave me, it put me on the map. Yeah. And then when I got into running kickboxing shows, John would um, bring the American team over and we would have international shows. And then my shows got bigger because I had... The, the Welsh come over, the Irish, the Belgium, we had the Russians, we had the whole lot in the kickboxing shows, and then we staged them at the Circus Tavern, the Civic Hall, and the Brentwood Centre. And they was, they was coming quite successful. Um, unfortunately at the time, I was going through some problems at home, so I couldn't put my whole heart into it, so yeah. I stopped them for a while. Later on, I, I went back to sort of local shows. So that was my sort of kickboxing side it gave me. So I then opened kickboxing schools and for lots of people considered that I was a kickboxing teacher, not a karateka. Um, but I try to explain I'm a martial artist. So we trained with that. And then later on, again, Pat O'Keefe hosted um, a guy named Jack Ottman, who's a Salat guru, guru coming over. I trained with him and I loved the Salat flowing movements. Absolutely so much so that I went over to um, Malaysia and trained with him. 
Wow. My then partner, Claire, come with me and we had a group of people and we trained over there 10 hours a day for a month in Malaysia, which was superb and I got a grading over there. Coming back, um, I carried on training and then I liked the idea of Thai boxing and because my job had packed up, so I went back and in, went into the therapy business. So I was training with um, an osteopath and I studied um, shiatsu. Um, but it was suggested that I tried Thai massage. So this gave me the opportunity to go to Thailand to study Thai massage and Thai boxing. So I tried, I tried Thai boxing. I, again, I took my partner with me. Um, she was a bit more accepted than I was because she was female and they quite liked yeah. her. <laughs> but it gave me an opportunity of fighting in the ring in Thailand, um, which was quite good. At least I know what it felt like and how tough they were. And living in a Thai village doing Thai massage. So I come back now again, and then I got still training with Jack Ottman coming over doing different courses. And he then introduced me to the Salat weapons, which were the Indonesian weapons. Right. Now, unlike the Japanese and Oriental weapons that I'd studied prior to that, which were the more traditional ones, such as the, you know, the Joe, the Tomfa, the sword, uh, Nonshuku and the Sai, these ones were bladed weapons and very vicious but I liked it. So again, Martin, a friend of mine, one of my instructors, and I went and trained with him over there, and he's been over several times. In actual fact, he's coming over next week. So we trained it in black, um, Silat Kabua. They're called combinations that you use in these Silat weapons. So there's the Karen bit, which I will show you later on. The Karen bit is probably the most vicious weapon that there is, it's like a bent blade. Yeah. Then there's a called a Kapak Cecil, which is like a small ax and obviously the knife. Um, so they, they are the, the predominant weapons that we, we train with. So then I incorporate those again. So it could appear it's a jack of all trades, master and none, but I think I've done an apprenticeship long enough to be able to incorporate those in. Jim, can I just ask, step in and ask you a question? So how did you find the, trans, the sort of transition from martial arts to actually martial art weapons? It's, does it help by having a martial art background or is it something totally new? Right, it's a good, good question that is, because it is, it, now I realise the importance of how incorporating the weapons with the martial arts is. Because initially, when the Okinawan you know, karate, they didn't just have karate, they had kabuto as well. Or they called it kabuto, mm -hmm. or Okinawan tei, which was incorporated in the weapons. Because lots of the karate katas that I have problems understanding the exact interpretation of make more sense if you were to put a weapon in your hand. Right. So some of the movements that are used to signify strength and different things make no sense to me and I like, I'm a logical person. So I look at them now, if they had a weapon, which they was originally put for, it would work. If you drop the weapon, then you use the unarmed side. So, yeah, so the weapons, I think, is really important. It also incorporates using of the hips because if you think of a weapon as being something that you can use to, to whip out rather than try to push, it works better. And yeah. then you apply that to the punching and kicking of karate and kickboxing. Yeah. So then, I, having studied that, I trained with a guy named Andy Newman in London with the current bit because it was... Um, I could go once a month with him, so I enjoyed that. And then I went to America and trained with a guy, guy student called Anthony Palmer, who was a student of um, Marquida, Doug Marquida, sorry, Doug Marquida, who is the Filipino weapons master in America. And I trained with him, stayed around his house. Um, he, he taught me lots of things, including the machete and the um, short sticks the uh, Screamer sticks or the Carly sticks. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed my trip and training with him. More recently, I went to America again and trained with a guy named Bruce Miller. Now, Bruce Miller is a mate, was a major in the um, American Army or the Special Forces, who I'd hosted over here one year, years ago. But we rekindled our friendship and he hosted me over in America and taught me a different side because he was um, a doctor, a medical officer, and in the special forces. So his concept of things like pressure points and vital points made more sense after training with him. Yeah. 
because I've always been a little skeptical of pressure point fighting and wondering, do they really work? And are, are they working against an aggressive opponent? But he showed me what he called vital points. Yeah, just, just from my own sort of uh, view on that, I always questioned, would the pressure points work if someone was sort of under the influence of alcohol or was drunk? They, or, they wouldn't. They wouldn't, no. In my opinion. I mean, yeah. everything in martial arts is an opinion. I, I know that. Yeah. However, vital points always work which is where the transition come for me to understand the difference with perhaps, should we say, trying to put, I'm quite strong. Um, one of the techniques that we're talking about, you know, our friend Eddie Blundell and Billy, their dad taught me how to put a pressure point on somebody and I can do that on most people. If they're angry or they don't want it done, it won't work. So I don't want to be messing around trying to do that on somebody when they want to punch my head in. Yeah. Whereas the eyes, and you know, there's certain areas under the nose. If they can't breathe, right, or they can't stand, or they can't see, then it works. So when you said the vital parts, is that what you're looking That's at, the face at. areas? Yep. Sort of and, eyes? and later on I will give you a small demonstration of yep. what I consider now. If I was to do um, a quick fire, short um, sort of course on somebody that needed to do it, you know, I'm not gonna teach people how to punch because it's gonna take a lifetime, but, Mike Tyson's eyes are still weak. You know, that's the way I see it. Could, yeah. And even if it didn't blind him, it would deflect him enough that you can come in with something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite passionate and I think a diverse, but someone asked me if, if they think that the gym now, would how we would get on with the gym of 30 years ago. And I say better, because I've learned not to have, to have what you call relative strength or relative power, which means, economy of movement and explosive um, as opposed to visual power which is what I was always paranoid about. So relative power with knowing the vital areas gives somebody a good advantage because you've got um, you can strike them to the eyes hit them and there's a small sequence of about eight techniques that I now teach as well as not instead of. And then as we said about the weapons I then what I call expedient weapons, which are weapons now that although that we use traditional ones, such as the Joe and the Sai and the Tomfa, we're not gonna have them with us. But if you practice with them and you learn the principles of the weapon, then that can be applied to what I call expedient weapons or improvised weapons, so that you can go use a book and strike somebody. You can use a pen. You can use, you know, a mobile phone. Ah, so you're converting you know, transforming whatever you've well, got around you. With, with the principles, because with if, if you principle. practice with a non-chuku, shall we say hypothetically, we're not going to carry a non-chuku down the high street with us. No, you're going to be arrested. And, uh... Yeah, <laughs> however, you could whip your belt off and it could be a flexible weapon with the same principles as the non-chuku has taught you. So that's why I try to use expedient weapons. So combining the whole things together now has, has rekindled my passion because I've had two hip operations and a few hernia operations. So physically, gymnastically, you know, I'm not as good as I used to be. Mm -hmm. However, confidence wise, and my knowledge to teach, I think is superior to what it was even five years. So it sounds, Jim, did you sort of convert it to more from a, a competition-y type fighter to more realistic street sort of I tactical think so. now? I think that if I'm, I've done competition, and in a particular style, like the finishing one, you know, I had moderate success. I'm not a competitor. I'm not, I'm not someone who had a great deal of um, success in competition because they're very gymnastic and I have great admiration for what they do, but it's what they do. They train that way. And I think that in life, we only get out what we put in. So if you train, you know, to be in a competition, whether or not it's MMA, it doesn't matter. If it's karate, it's going to be that it's second still, nature for you when you. Yeah, in reality, and, it, and it's yeah. still got these. Um, they've still got rules. Yeah. Whereas, I've been fortunate, and some people say unfortunate, to have um, friendship with lots of people that we say have been in urban situations. Yeah. Right. I'm being as diplomatic as I can. I mean, Eddie and Billy Blundell were both really good friends of mine, and Gaffer is another one. Uh, Steve Knight, uh, Kieran White, uh, Jeff Thompson, Rupert, all the different people that have tried and tested their techniques out have passed tips to me. 
So although that I don't want to work on the door, I, I don't think I look you know, um, intrusive enough. So I, I take what they say and everyone, although they're all different parts, have got the same thing about it. it's going first, you go fast, you go quick and you don't stop. So that is different to when I teach karate with the high block and everything against pre-empted attacks. It's stepping stones to reach, depends what goal you want. If you want to go in the ring, you've trained the ring. Some of my students have gone to Steve Kerridge, which is far more experienced with ring fighters than me. It's funny you should say that. We had an interview with Steve Kerridge yesterday. Wow. He came on. Yeah. Well, Steve is a good friend of mine. He used to come and train in my garden and we both have a respect for each other. He has expanded on, he's, he's taught more competitors than I have. So if somebody wants to go and train in the ring, then I suggest they go and train with him because you've got people like Luke, he's one of his top fighters, was initially one of mine. Jason was initially one of mine. Um, but I reach him to a certain level because I'm not that committed with the competition scene. Yeah. So I've got no problem. Steve Knight, who trains, uh, who teaches fighting in Canvey Island, runs all the doors. He's crude, of course, right? but we have a great friendship together. Uh, and he tells me the same thing, it, what, what works. So I yeah. take on board that certain things, uh, Kieran White is another guy that's well respected in the area, always said that sort of 70% of his karate didn't work. He said, but 30% did. So I try to glean knowledge. So now with the, the weapons, that I can transpose into the expedient weapons and the karate that I can use as a foundation for the other aspects, locking out with the power as opposed to being relative power. So it's, it's, a, certain, it's a different way of training. Yeah. I'm happy with what I teach, but I know like everything we acquire tastes, and it's horses for courses. Yeah, I've noticed in the martial art world, people say, uh, oh, this one's better than that one, that one's better than that one, but I've learned over the years myself that it's something, for everyone's different, oh, yeah. so one thing may not suit someone else. No. Also, size is a different opinion. Someone that's huge, the same techniques might not work for someone that's little, so Brilliant. it's finding you know, yep. what's, what works for you, isn't it, in the martial arts? Oh, exactly, I mean, I, I have, there's um, Pat Drake, who was one of Bob Lawrence's top jiu-jitsu. He's probably one of the top jiu-jitsu people in the country, right? He's now, he comes around here and teaches me the UI of bow. Now, Pat um, is incredibly strong. Now, he's, he works in the meat market, so he, he's big. His jiu-jitsu skills are second to none. But, you know, we have discussions, and I say, that there's no way I could put a strangle on someone like him. So the only way would have to be one of the sort of vital areas. So it is horses, as you said earlier on, it's horses for courses. Yeah. And what you want, if you want your, um, if you want to have a social side, if you want to be in competitions, if you want to have a punch up, you train that way. Because what you train becomes your habit. Jim, can I just ask you, have you ever had to use your martial arts in a, in a real life situation anywhere? Have you ever been put in that sort of right. position? Like Bruce Lee said to me once, well, he didn't actually say it to me, but <laughs> he, he said, the fight without fighting, all right? And I had one, uh, one good incident of that was I was approached at a boot sale by some travellers, trying to be very diplomatic in what I'm saying here, who challenged me for a fight. And I don't know if they knew who I was or if I had a logo on or whatever, but two of them come up and asked me for a fight. Now, I'm a I mean, granddad, for God's sake. I don't really want to be fighting in a boot sale. Having <laughs> said that, I'm also not going to back down. So... The scenario was a friend of mine, Albie, and his wife were coming towards me and they thought that these were friends of mine. So I just said to them, uh, what's the chances? And he's, my friend Albie said, oh, they've got Bob Hope and no hope. Right? Anyway, he said, no, come. So we had to walk over to the car park. Now, so there's Albie and his wife and the two travellers and me. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm going over there to fight, but I can't not. So... He said to me, OK, what are the rules? I don't know where it come from, and it's a bit embarrassing to say. But I said, I'll tell you what, let's just fight to the death, shall we? And he went, yeah, effing mad. And I said, I know. So whether or not he sensed that oh, I am a bit mad or <laughs> it was a good bluff, I don't know. But they, they went away. So that was without fighting. 
So that was that. Um, yes, I had another incident once. Was um, when I lived at one house. My wife never used to go out very much, and she went out one night and left me babysitting. So I was great. I, I had the house to myself. I'm not training that night. My children were in bed, and then I kept hearing banging on the window. And I wonder if you know that. I just assumed it was my brother coming over or something. Anyway, I looked out, and there were some people at the crowd on firing air rifles at my house. And I had these big bullet windows that there was fashionable at the time, like Georgian ones, and they cracked them, so that's how powerful the guns were. Mm. So I went out after them, and they fired the gun at me. So I run back in and grabbed hold of my sword, right, and I went after them. <laughs> and uh, they, they scattered all by one, so I grabbed him, brought him back to my house, and then I'm trying to get him into the house. I had his gun and he, he wouldn't come in. And then I we talk about strength and everything. I'm, I'm quite strong. But I couldn't put a flipping arm lock on him, right? And he was mouthing off to me. And I'm waiting there, trying to get him in. My children are in bed, my wife's out. And in the end, I just, I hit back him, right? And, and it finished it off. But in the sake of it, I broke my case of my sword which was unfortunate because when I went to get it repaired, the guy that was repairing it offered to swap it for a smaller one. And then I found out subsequently that my sword was worth 5,000 oh, pounds. And the one I got was a 100 pounds ex-army for Second World War sword. Oh, so yes, yeah, so that fight cost me. And then the police come. Oh, sorry, I forgot that bit. So the, I called the police. So the police arrived and they come in the house and there's him covered in blood and there's me. Um, you know, in the kitchen, and then so they've they've had to get them. So he dropped the cases for me, and I dropped the case to him. And my wife come home after a night out, seeing two police cars in the house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so what you've been up to. So that was one, and then I had a road rage one, which was um, taking my brother and cousin for a trial at Colchester Football Club, and uh, they was you know scout you know, they're uh, talent scouted. On the way there, we had an accident and the guy got out and I had some road rage, so I got arrested then, so they missed there. So they blame me for the whole life that they're not professional footballers. Oh, so yes, yeah. so I try not to have too many fights. <laughs> <laughs> try to avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Jim, can I just touch a little bit about your books now? So how, how did you yeah. become into being an author? Or right. how, how do you go down that process of being a writer? Okay, when it started off, I used to go around to a friend of mine to have my car done, and he used to say, tell me what incidents you've had this week then. <laughs> you know, I'm like an incident addict. You know, they th I'm uh, obsessed at buying things. I get in confrontations, I get in incidences, and he said, you should write a book. So I then thought, that I was in, a, you know, I've been in different magazines, but I was in magazines just so that I could encourage people, because... You know, a combination of what's happened to me and I, I believe people with low self-esteem should be encouraged because at the time that I was growing up, if you wasn't good at football, you wasn't picked. You wasn't encouraged to play. And people say to me, oh, I wish I could do this. So anyone can. So I have a passion to put over um, my experiences to help people. And that's not trying to be getting hearts of gold or getting you know, mm -hmm. an MBE anything at all it was just a, I wanted to help people so I thought if I wrote down my incidences good and bad and um, then hopefully it, it will you know come out and encourage other people yeah so that's what I've tried to do yeah nice <laughs> unfortunately so, the only I got a bad review from my one of my <laughs> one of my ex-partners mum read it and she gave it the only bad review on Amazon because it said yeah. something about her daughter. So, so Jim, what, what sort of, um, where does your future lie now with your martial arts and training? Uh, what? Right, I am happier now. Oh, I've done, I've cut down my teaching a little bit. When the lockdown come, I've got friends to come around and train in the garden. I've got my own little dojo at Dunton, and, but I've cut down two or three of the classes because I found I was tired. Yeah. Right? Um, I drive from here to there half hour, come home at night, and especially on a Tuesday when we've had a beer afterwards. So I thought if I do less, I'll enjoy it more. Mm -hmm. So now I'm quite passionate about, I've got a kickboxing organization with instructors and I have sort of, I teach them once a week and oversee the gradings and the close quarter courses. 
uh, I teach around here. People come around here. I, I don't charge. I just I just enjoy teaching. Tony Charles comes around every week yep. and trains, and a few other people. Um, and then for people that want it, I think I can teach them something extra, which is the add-on bits, not instead of add-on bits, which is like, well, I, I don't know what to call it, whether they call it urban as opposed to street fighting. Um, that's just something that I feel quite passionate like about. Like more the stuff that would work in reality? I think so. And yeah. I'll sort of show you some of the, just, I, I try to give you snippets of yeah. what I do. Yeah, that'd be great. I look forward so, to that. So that's what I do. <laughs> so Jim, is there any words of advice for people that, like you say, that feel sort of under under encouraged or low self esteem? What words of advice can you give them? Right. Well, it's something I'm very passionate about, so I can go on for this one. I think the hardest thing is for people to walk in the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. That is daunting. I understand that. Right. That's what I did when I went to the boxing club. You know, and everyone in there was looked like something out of Rocky, and I had to walk in there as a skinny little kid. You know, <laughs> and the first punch on the nose scared me, and everything. It was horrible. However, I would say that all my instructors, especially, are really encouraging anybody to welcome the whole lot because we all understand what it's like, and because I still train under different people, it rekindles the idea of what it's like to have to learn. But make that step. Phone me. Come in. Talk to me. I would say 75 of the people don't turn up because at the last minute they think they're going to walk in, especially, unfortunately, kickboxing is not quite marketed properly because it gives the impression that everyone who goes kickboxing has got to get in the ring. It's not. Kickboxing, in my opinion, is about combination techniques, pad works, um, you know, controlled drills like we do in karate and sparring, but a bit more realistic than perhaps some of the point side from my side, that's the way I see it. But do it, anyone can do anything. I, I really think that, um, you know, I, I didn't have, as I say, I was bad at spelling. My, my English teachers think of me writing three books would probably call me a liar. I think I've got a ghostwriter <laughs> or something. Right? And, and my PE teacher used to give me the slipper for cheat. I mean, at school, I was that bad. I used to cheat at the cross country. <laughs> I mean, this is this is that bad, right? And people that knew our PE teacher, he was a tyrant, and and I cheated. I thumbed the lift on a motorbike, and, and got caught thumbing the lift. So I didn't only got the slipper. I had to do it again afterwards, right? Oh no! <laughs> so anyone in my class that if I look on this Facebook thing, say, "Oh, McAllister, flipping geeky bloke that stuttered, come last, cheated in a combination, has written books, and is that." It must be a different person. It's good though to see how you've sort of you've yeah. changed a bit of transformation, oh, isn't it? So I tell my grandchildren, and they, you can do anything. You can. Do it. But my my son is incredibly talented. He can do things. My daughter has had to work hard, but she thanks me for the tenacity that she inherited. So she's got a degree in different subjects. She teaches as a social worker. You know, she's very successful. My son is successful without boasting, but he didn't find it. My son fought in kickboxing and was winning against Jason, who was the world champion, until he ran out of steam. And he didn't even practice. He didn't even practice. So some people have got it, and some people haven't. Yeah. My best students are the ones that I've got. John McQuillan is 75. I have to write left and right on his hands, but I get the biggest pleasure when he got his black belt last year. Yeah, So I, I love it. I love people that can't get it, and yeah. I can teach them. Jim, where, where can people find you if they want to train with you? What can right. they? Uh... Okay, well, they, I, have, I have a website, um, yeah, McAllister Martial Arts, or they can look at my, um, they can email me at jamesgmcallister at yahoo.com, or they can phone me 0775 I've got a class, I've got a, my own dojo in Dunton, um, and you can look me up. Um, you, you can put me on. Facebook, or you can look me on to um, YouTube, Google me, anything, just Jim McAllister Martial Arts or McAllister Kickboxing, it, I'm quite easily you know, found. Okay. And just, just where can they find your books, Jim, if they want to come to If, if they want book? a signed copy, <laughs> yeah. that they can contact me, and I've got some here, otherwise Amazon has got them. And okay. Liquid Bullet Promotions. And Liquid yeah. Bullet Promotions. We'll have right. them on there for you next week. Jelly good, well yeah. that's, that's right, but all I would say is, I am, and I reiterate this all the time, anyone can do it because I did it. And that's not me trying to boost myself up. 
as I said, people know my life story. They would, my school friends would be pulling their hair out. They would, you know, they'd think, no, God, <laughs> you know, it's not him. But I had low self-esteem. It's given me a great social life. But I thought, you've got to be humble and politeness is not a weakness. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not against swearing. I don't swear a lot in the car I do a bit, perhaps, but, <laughs> and, and I don't like bullying, um, and I like humour. And all those things can be incorporated. The old ways, the old Japanese ways, you know, I've been up to train with the Japanese. I mean, I, t I toured Japan um, with Albie. We, we oh, that's another, sorry, I forgot this one. We went, when we toured Japan and Okinawa, I fought the Japanese kickboxing champion. Well, no, I was on the receiving end of the Japanese kickboxing champion and limped all the way around Okinawa because of it. <laughs> uh, I trained with a, a, guy, a guy named Don Chapman, who was a, a Canadian Mounted Police that gave us the ticket to train with all the clubs in Okinawa, which was unheard of. I was befriended by them and it was great. And I even went to the karaoke with them. So I've trained with all those people in Japan and Okinawa. And celebrated well. with them after. <laughs> Great, and I realised that the Okinawans are more, um, should we say, liberated than the, you know, they're, they're less upper lipped, you know. It's, yeah. Great. So I've met, I've met some really nice people over it, and, and my students and my family. I, I get upset when people leave, not because of why they leave, because they're part of my family, and they really yeah. are. I do that. Those two chaps here that you'll see outside. They're both um, sort of third dans. They, they study karate, kickboxing, weaponry. One's a professional musician and one's a scaffolder, forklift. They're tough as anything. And, but they come around here and we have a banter as much as we do as the training. And we're going to get you to show us a bit now and uh, yes, we're trying to give you a, a bit, aren't we? <laughs> uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll wear some different outfits because I think it's yeah. in keeping with the discipline I'm doing. Yeah. So the first one will be karate. I'll explain why I'm wearing. Um, in karate, Fudoshin, the black belts are entitled to wear a hakama, which is like a skirt type of thing. And you have a colored gi, mine's a bit faded now, and an animal symbol, and mine's a lion. Mm -hmm. And that's why you probably see lion memorabilia. And it's supposed to represent your character and personality. And I'm not sure if the lion is because a lion sleeps a lot and it's got long hair, <laughs> or it's vicious, I don't, I don't know. But. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks okay. for coming, appreciate it. All right, okay, I'll go and put my attire on. <laughs>